Father, we thank you for the privilege, the opportunity that we have once again tonight to come into your presence. And Lord, we just pray that you will speak to our hearts tonight, God. Accept our worship. Lord, as we praise and we worship you, uh, help us to focus our attention on you because you're worthy, you're deserving of our praise tonight. Lord, let our hearts be fertile soil for the seed of the word of God to fall on tonight. We're believing you for eternal results in our lives, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.
you for who you are, Lord. We thank you for your presence moving in our lives. Hallelujah. We honor you tonight. Hallelujah. We praise you, Lord. We give you glory. Hallelujah. You are my
mind. We thank you that you are the master over everything. God, you're in control. Lord, we yield our hearts to you tonight. God, we lay our burdens down. We lay our problems down at your feet, knowing that you have the answers. You are mighty to save. You are awesome. You are limitless, Lord. God, we look to you. We look to your resources. We look for your right hand, your mighty right hand, that hand of authority to reach into our lives and to help us tonight. Hallelujah. We give you the remainder of the service. God, teach us from your word. Draw us closer to you through the study of your word tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's turn to Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2. We've covered all of chapter 1. And if you miss those uh, services, we have those on um, our YouTube channel as well as our church cloud. If you just go to the church website and uh, click on messages and then select whether you want audio only. If you want audio only, it would be church cloud. And you can listen to that while you're working. Sometimes you're certain jobs you're allowed to have earphones on or if you have ch a chance to watch the video uh, those are on youtube and hopefully those will be a blessing to you and share them with others amen uh, people that need to hear uh, what we've been talking about in the book of galatians but uh, galatians chapter 2 we're going to look at verses 1 through 10 we're going to read that from the expositor study bible with its notes in just a moment but uh, in chapter 1 we covered the introduction to the book covered some background information, and uh, we won't go over all of that again. We've also covered Paul dealing with another gospel. And man, I want us to keep in our mind the context of, of what we've already been dealing with. So as we move forward, uh, Paul is much like a lawyer, like an attorney. He builds his case as he goes. And so if we remember what, what he's already been talking about, it helps as we move forward. He talked about uh, another gospel being preached by the very religious Judaizers which really just presented another Jesus. Same thing going on today, isn't it? Another Jesus is being presented, and that's motivated by another spirit other than the Holy Spirit. And uh, so Paul began to deal with that in chapter 1. We talked about how that's not much different than what's going on right now. In chapter 1, we also looked at the revelation of Jesus Christ to us through the gospel. Amen. In this book, God opens up, he discloses, he unveils himself, if you will, uh, who he is and what he's done for us and his divine plan, his plan of redemption for us. And so if we allow the gospel to be that, it can be a revelation of Jesus Christ to us every time that we open it up. And last week we closed out chapter one, discovering what Paul's gospel of grace was really all about. What is a gospel of grace? We hear a grace revolution message today, but it's not the gospel of grace that Paul preached. The gospel of grace that Paul preached had to do with the working of the goodness of God into our lives by the Holy Spirit. And that only happens, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, by grace through faith. Amen? Faith in what? Not faith in our religion, not faith in our denomination, not even faith in our faith. Oh, I'm a faith, I'm a faith person. We brag about our faith. We ought to brag about the cross, amen? Not brag about our faith. If you're bragging about your faith, that probably tells you where your focus is. And that's going to show you what results are going to happen. Failure every time. But when we brag about Jesus and his finished work, then we know he's the object of our faith, amen? Does that make sense? That's the gospel of grace. 
The Holy Spirit is able to move in our lives, as we talked about last week, because our focus is on Jesus and Him crucified. And so we're going to continue on from that point tonight into chapter 2. Paul's about to get down to business and uh, really get going on some things. So let's look at chapter 2. And as I said, we'll read the notes as well. Uh, so just bear with me on that. And uh, I think it'll be some good information that'll help us. Chapter 2, verse 1. Then 14 years after, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas. It was probably the Jerusalem council and took Titus with me also. And I went by, up by revelation. The Lord told him to go and communicated unto them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, the message of the cross, but privately to them which were of reputation to at least some of the original twelve, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. If the twelve or even James, the Lord's brother, repudiated this gospel of grace, at least as far as the Gentiles were concerned, this would create an insurmountable barrier. Verse 3, but neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, which would be a Gentile, was compelled to be circumcised. Paul, Paul probably took him as a test case. And that because of false brethren unawares brought in, suggest they were fellow believers, but their insistence upon the necessity of the law constituted a denial of Christ in Paul's eyes, who came in privily, subtly, to spy out our liberty which we have in Christ Jesus. The truth of the gospel was at stake that they might bring us into bondage. Forsaking the cross always results in bondage. Verse 5, to whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour. Paul would not yield one iota nor compromise in the slightest, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. Justification by faith is what was on trial. But of these false brethren who seemed to be somewhat Whatsoever they were, it makes no matter to me. God accepts no man's person. For they who seemed to be somewhat in conference added nothing to me. There was nothing anyone there could add to the revelation given to him by the Lord as it regards the cross. But contrarywise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision, the Gentiles, was committed unto me, presents the Jerusalem apostles championing the cause of Paul after they heard the issue discussed in private conference as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter. So Peter went to the Jews, Paul went to the Gentiles, and it became obvious to everybody when they talked. Verse 8, For he who wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the Jews, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. And when James, the Lord's brother, Cephas, who is Peter, and John, who seemed to be pillars, a metaphor, perceived the grace that was given unto me, the message of grace, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship, a pledge of friendship and agreement, that we should go unto the heathen, the Gentiles, and they unto the circumcision, or the Jews. Verse 10, only they would that we should remember the poor, the poor saints in Jerusalem, who had suffered terrible hardships because of persecution, the same which I also was forward to do. Paul saw the need and felt he must respond favorably, which he did. All right, and so we want to look at this passage and... Uh, Paul, again, is laying some groundwork because of these religious uh, people who have come, again, to the Galatians that Paul won to the Lord out of paganism, out of a heathen way of life. They had never been uh, in a church before. There would be Gentiles and unchurched people today would be a good correlation uh, for what we're talking about. We have a lot of unchurched people in America, don't we? Although we have a church on every corner, but we have quite a few people who are biblically illiterate. And we have to go over things that wouldn't seem elementary to, the, to us who've been saved a long time. Because they're, they're basically like Gentiles. They're unchurched. They don't know how to act even in church, some of them. And, uh, and I think that's sad, but it's a reality that we have to realize. And that's who the Galatians were to Paul. They were unchurched. They were, all they knew was worshiping other gods and sacrificing to other gods when Paul brought the gospel of grace to them. And they get saved, and then these religious people want to come and steal Paul's sheep, the, one that, the ones that he's led to the Lord, by adding Jesus plus. You get saved by Jesus, but you also have to keep these religious laws from the Old Testament. And we may not see that exact same thing. There is a Hebraic movement going on in our country, which is basically the exact same thing as the Judaizers, although I haven't heard them advocate circumcision, <laughs> but they advocate everything else from the Old Testament, the feast days, the Seder feasts, 
all of those things. Um, if you're going to keep one part of the law, you have to keep it all. We'd have to be doing animal sacrifice to actually be fulfilling the old covenant. And all of that we don't have to do. Why? Because Jesus said it's finished. It's fulfilled in Christ. He offered himself, Hebrews chapter 9, once for all. Amen? And praise God for that. We're under grace. We're not under law. And that's what Paul is dealing with in this chapter. So tonight I want to look at four facts establishing confirmation of Paul's mission to preach the gospel of grace, the message of the cross, to the Gentiles. And I think we can see that in these first ten verses. And that's what he's trying to establish. That he didn't call himself. And the twelve apostles had nothing to do with this call. It was a revelation from Jesus Christ. We need some preachers today who can remember when God called them into the ministry. Amen? Who have an exact moment when, when God spoke to them and said, I want you to preach my word. Whether it's as a pastor, an evangelist, a missionary, a youth pastor, however... There ought to be an exact moment that you can go back and say, that's when the Lord called me. And it's not because somebody patted us on the back and said, you make a good preacher. Amen. It's because the Lord told us that's what we ought to be doing. And we need some preachers. I think we've, as we said last week, we've got a lot of mama called preachers in churches. And uh, they're thinking of it more of a business. And it's not a business. It's the master's business, but it's not a business like the world thinks of business and if we look at it that way I think it's a mess and we're going to cause a lot of people to lose out spiritually with what God has for them it's a dangerous thing so we need to know that we're called so four facts establishing Paul's mission to preach the gospel of grace the message of the cross to the Gentiles number one Paul takes Barnabas and Titus to the Jerusalem church All right, the Jerusalem church is basically what developed from the 120 after the day of Pentecost and the twelve apostles were very instrumental. Those who weren't scattered, at least. Some of them were scattered. But those who weren't scattered, um, God used them to build the church, what we know as the church. It was the birthplace of the church. And so that's who Paul is talking about here. The name Barnabas, this person that Paul took with him, his name means son of consolation. He was an encourager. No, we need people like that. We need exhorters in our life. We need people who don't always see the glass as half empty. Amen? And believe me, you can be saved and still have a, a, that kind of mindset. The glass is always half empty. We need people, and thank God He brings them alongside of us in our daily walk, who are exhorters, encouragers, who, for them, it may seem like the sun is always shining. Amen? Like the glass is always half full. And if that's you, you're like, well, what are you talking about? That's the way it is. <laughs> An exhorter and encourager, that's how they see life. And that's the way God has wired them. And we need people like that in the body of Christ. And that's who Barnabas was. He was a disciple of Jesus Christ, a companion of St. Paul in his labors. He was a Levite born in the island of Cyprus, whose proper name was Joses. The apostles added to it the name Barnabas. God, probably because of his character, because of his gifting. And so uh, Bar Barnabas is, was one of the partners of Paul early on in his ministry. When everybody else was scared, wouldn't you have been? Uh, this very man who was breathing out threatenings and had letters in his hand to arrest those who were of the way, followers of Jesus, even probably standing, consenting to the death of Stephen, who was stoned for being a follower of the way. Um, now he says he's saved, and nobody witnessed it <laughs> on the road to Damascus, just him and the Lord. Um, but it's, you, you'd want to see some fruit, wouldn't you? Barnabas was one of the first people to step alongside Paul and say, you know what, God's done a work. There's been a change, amen? And people ought to see less of us, more of him, when the Holy Spirit has come in and made a change in our lives. Barnabas saw that. Barnabas befriended the former Pharisee, Saul, when most of the apostles still, still feared Paul. Acts chapter 9. Barnabas invited him to share in a broader ministry in Antioch. So Paul had been in this wilderness time. As we talked about in chapter 1. He got saved. But then God set him apart in the area of Arabia. I think we talked about last week. And that's the desert. That's a wilderness experience. Sometimes God has to separate us from everything else. And we feel like we're all alone. And we feel like we cry out to God. And it just echoes into the distance. But God is there, but he's trying to strip away the wrong teaching, the wrong things that we've 
we've grown up uh, receiving. And that's what Paul had to have done for quite a while, several years. Jesus had to take all that religious garbage from being a Pharisee, all the traditions that he had interpreted wrongly from Scripture, and, and turn them around to the gospel of grace, the message of the cross. And that came by revelation. It didn't come from anybody else helping out. It was the Lord himself. And so Barnabas recognizes that and invites him after those years of being in the wilderness, come join me. I want you to help me in ministry in Antioch. And uh, we need to look around and uh, look for opportunities. We don't want to be foolish and plug in somebody who's unchurched into ministry where souls are at stake. Amen? If they're not mature in their faith. And a lot of churches do that and to their peril. And to, uh, it leads to things that don't turn out well. We need to make sure that someone has a grasp of the Word of God, an understanding of the message of the cross before they stand up in ministry to share that with others. And so that's what uh, Barnabas does. He comes alongside Paul. Thank the Lord when we were lost and undone without God or His Son, God sent someone like Barnabas. Can you think of some people when you first got saved that the Lord used to disciple you? I can think of Royal Ranger commanders, Sunday school teachers. Uh, I can think of some people, some pastors that I'm thankful for that encouraged me in the things of God. And that's what helped us grow. Amen? That's what helped Paul get started. And thank the Lord, even after getting saved, the Lord sends brothers and sisters in Christ to come alongside of us, to encourage us, to exhort us, to be and to do all that God purposed and that He destined for us to be and to do it. It's in that order, right? God's more concerned about who you are before you start doing. And sometimes we want to get somebody plugged in and we want to get them playing the drums or playing the piano or teaching a Sunday school class or watching our kids in kids church and they haven't got a grasp on who they are in Christ yet. It's a dangerous, dangerous formula. Just because they're busy in the church doesn't mean that their life is victorious. They need to understand victory through Jesus and the cross first, who they are, and then they can do, because the Holy Spirit will do it through them, amen, things that will be a blessing in the church. And so we, we can learn a lot from this example. Uh, Paul took the Gentile Titus with him as well. And probably it says in the Expositor's Notes, and uh, Dr. Rossier says the same thing, that Titus was probably a test case. He took him to the Jerusalem church to see how they would react. I bet, how, how do you think Titus felt? <laughs> He's the guinea pig to see whether the, the main church of Jesus Christ, the new church, they weren't really called Christians just yet, I don't believe, but they're being taken to Jerusalem. He's being taken to Jerusalem to see if they'll accept him or not as truly a, a, a a trophy of God's grace and, and having received Jesus. And uh, it turns out good, thank the Lord, uh, but I'm sure it was nerve-wracking for both Paul and Titus. And if justification was by faith in Jesus Christ and Him crucified, God's grace and not observance of the law, then Titus getting saved without circumcision would have to be accepted. It would have to be approved. And so that's what Paul is taking Titus with him for is with that express purpose of putting that issue on the table with a real person standing right in front of them. And they can't deny God's grace. How many know you can, you can have an argument, but you can't argue with a testimony? Amen? You can't argue with a testimony. And when God's changed a life, um, there's undeniable evidence there. A modern-day example of this might be when an unchurched person comes to faith in Jesus Christ and the cross. What do we do as a church? Do we try and tell them to cover up their tattoos, cut their hair, wear modest clothes, etc., etc.? Too often that's what we do. Or do we teach them about sanctification? Wouldn't that be a better thing? By way of the same cross they got saved at, so that the Holy Spirit can help them grow and help them mature. And He can tell them what to do with their hair or what to do with their externals. Amen? Let God deal with the internal first, the heart. And then out of that will flow the external things that need to change. Quit smoking cigarettes, quit cussing, all those things sometimes are a process, right? When we first got saved, those things didn't all fall off right away necessarily. It's a process of the Lord doing it. And don't do the Holy Spirit's job, amen? He does a better job. Let's let God, when the unsaved and unchurched come in to finished work worship center, 
Let's let the Holy Spirit clean them up. Amen? Let's let Him do a work. Just speak the truth to them in love. Allow the Holy Spirit to clean them up from the inside out. Teach them about sanctification and growing. And then it comes the same way you got saved, by way of the cross. And the Lord will do the work. All right, number two. Paul went to the Jerusalem church by revelation, not invitation. We can see that in verse 2. It says, I went up by revelation and communicated to them the gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to those who were of reputation, lest by any means I might run or had run in vain. And so uh, the phrase, I went up by revelation, refers to revelation from the Lord, like we talked about in chapter 1. And we need revelation from the Lord. We need the Lord to speak to us. Nothing the Lord gives us in quote-unquote revelation will contradict His Word. Amen? If it doesn't line up with His Word, it's your medication is off. <laughs> There's too many anchovies on your pizza like we said this morning. And you just dismiss it and move on. Because the enemy can try and influence our thoughts, can't he? And we just need to recognize that wasn't the Lord. Or some well-intentioned... Christians or so-called Christians will tell you if you've been saved and in the church long enough, you've probably had this at least once or twice. I have a word from the Lord for you. Well, you can listen to them and be kind and respectful, but if it doesn't line up with the word of God and if it doesn't bear witness with things that the Lord has already shown you about your life, then you just dismiss it and move on and say thank you and just move on. And you don't have to worry about correcting it, fixing it. The Lord will take care of that. Amen. Just commit them to the Lord. And if they want to keep pressing about it, just say, well, I just I don't find agreement with that. It doesn't line up with the Word of God. It doesn't line up with the things the Lord showed me. But thank you. And um, they'll, they'll get over it. And, and it'll be fine. But we've got to be careful uh, about revelation. The Lord wants to show us some things. And uh, Paul said he went up by revelation. And that's revelation from the Lord. The Lord told him to do it. And it wasn't in obedience to an authoritative order from the twelve. They didn't invite him. He invited himself. Because the Lord had put it upon his heart. This is what he needed to do. To help further the cause of the gospel of grace going forward. The, there are responsibilities we have today as believers in 2016. Given to us by revelation from God and his word. And we need to carry them out in simple faith and simple obedience. Not so that we can get a pat on the back by some religious leader, right? Recognition from some religious denomination or organization or the accolades of men, but because we live only to please Jesus, amen? There's gonna be books opened and every one of us, Romans chapter 14, I think it's verse 12, every one of us will give an account of himself to God. God's not gonna call the general superintendent of the assemblies of God as a witness, amen? He doesn't need him. Not that he doesn't need him, but he doesn't need him as a witness. Amen? Yeah. He knows the tr truth. He keeps good books. And what he's told you to do, you better do, whether the general superintendent of the assemblies of God is in agreement with it or not. You better be doing what the Lord is telling you to do. The Pharisees certainly weren't in agreement with what Paul was doing when he got after he got saved. And the majority of the church who he had been arresting was certainly not in approval or giving him accolades to preach the gospel after he had gotten saved. But the Lord had told Paul, he felt probably like the whole world was against him. Have you ever been there? But he, he knew what the Lord had told him to do. And you have to walk in simple faith and simple obedience. You may never get a pat on your back in this life, but God keeps good records. And he will reward those who are faithful to his instructions. Listen to this quote. God's purpose apparently was to assure James, Peter, and John, as well as the other apostles, that Paul indeed was preaching the gospel of the liberating grace of God that they were. He's preaching the same gospel. And he wanted to show these other disciples that he's, he's preaching the same thing and show them that there's something more that's going to happen. Amen? There's something more through what he had given Paul. What was Paul referring to when he says lest by any means I might run or had run in vain. After personally being used of the Lord to lead many Gentiles to salvation through the gospel of grace, his fear was that those in authority in the Jerusalem church, by insisting on the Mosaic ritual circumcision, might thwart his past and present efforts at establishing a church 
that would be free from all the connections with the Mosaic economy, which had been set aside at the cross. Amen? I am crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. The life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith. Amen? And the Son of God loved me and gave himself for me. The next verse says, I do not frustrate the grace of God. If we, if we put our faith in something Jesus plus or something other than God's redemption plan, if we go back to the Old Testament law, the Mosaic law, we're frustrating the grace of God. The Holy Spirit can't move in our life like he wants to because the object of our faith is not Jesus and him crucified, and which is the fulfillment of all those feasts. Amen. Jesus is the fulfillment of the, of the candlestick. In the, in the tabernacle, in the temple. He is the bread of life, which the showbread represented. He is the altar of incense. All of those things were represented in Jesus. So when he said it is finished, he meant it, the old covenant was done. There was a new covenant established through his blood. And that's what we need to learn from uh, Paul's preaching here uh, in, in Galatians chapter 2. Our race of faith can be run in vain. If we begin to believe that our trying harder, the work of our own hands or our confession or religious deeds, as good as they may be, will add anything to what Jesus accomplished on the cross. If that's true, Jesus didn't have to die. We could have just tried harder, right? Could have just read more chapters, prayed more hours, fasted more days, more months, right? I love Brother Swagger when he says you can... You can fast until they can pull you through a keyhole. And it, if, if it's not necessarily going to make you any more spiritual. And really under the old covenant, they only fasted one day a year. And that was before the Day of Atonement. That was a regular fast. So all these 40 days of fasting, it's not scriptural under either covenant. And, uh, but we're trying to add to what Jesus did at the cross. There's nothing we can add to what Jesus did. God's redemption plan was perfect because Jesus was perfect, is perfect. And we need to trust in what he accomplished at the cross and nothing else. It's never ever Jesus plus. And we need to get that in our heads. The modern church uh, gets duped, gets seduced, if you will, way too often by someone's book or by some charismatic speaker, whoever the latest person is that we're elevating on a pedestal. And we get duped into thinking it's Jesus plus. Well, they're talking about Jesus, so they must be good. And, but then they're saying we need to do this too. No, you just need Jesus. You just need what he did. It has nothing to do with your trying harder, your efforts, your confession, whatever the latest fad and trend is. It has to do with Jesus. It's always exclusive faith in Jesus alone, who he is, and what he has done. And so when everybody else around you is getting enamored by whatever the latest thing is, you need to get in your prayer closet and say, God, I just want to remember right now who you are and begin to call out in Scripture who it says he is. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. He's our rock. Go through those things and remind yourself who he is. And that will cause faith, to proper faith, to rise up. And remember what he's done at Calvary. For what that what that accomplishes, what that gives you, and that will keep you from error, keep you from those other things. The only faith that God recognizes and that His Holy Spirit will build in our lives is faith that has Jesus Christ and Him crucified as its object or focus. God does not recognize any other kind of faith. We have lots of faith in this city, people of different faiths, but the only one that God recognizes you say, well, that's pretty, uh, that's pretty exclusive. Well, it's exclusive. It's only faith in Jesus, God's only Son, and His finished work that God recognizes. All the other stuff is a waste of time. It really is. It makes us feel good about ourselves when we do all these religious things. But the only faith that God recognizes, and really when it comes right down to it, is God doesn't see you. He doesn't see your efforts. He doesn't see your good deeds, no matter how religious they may be, no matter whose example you may be following. He looks for his son. If you're hidden in Jesus, God says, I approve of that. If you're not, he doesn't approve of that. And that's God's redemption plan. And so we've got to get in Christ. God will not recognize and respond to faith in our faith, faith in our efforts, faith in our intentions. We've got a lot of that going on. Faith in our trying harder, faith in a system of man or the so-called church 
organization. He wants faith in Jesus and his finished work. And we've got to be hidden in Christ. Number three, Titus was living proof of the effectiveness of the gospel of grace. Verses three through five. Let's look at that again. Yet not even Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. And this occurred because a false brethren secretly brought in, who came in by stealth to spy out our liberty. Think about it. Somebody found out that Titus wasn't circumcised. That's how crazy religious people are, if you think about that doesn't take much to figure that out. Spy out our liberty which we have in Christ Jesus that they might bring us into bondage. Always looking for a scandal. Isn't that the modern church? Instead of restoring someone with grace and the power of the Holy Spirit by way of the cross, we're looking for a scandal. To whom we did not yield submission even for an hour that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. When we don't interfere with the work of the Holy Spirit in a new convert's life, that only God can do that work. It's amazing what a change the Holy Spirit can bring. Amen. Amen. And it doesn't take long when we just get out of the way and let the Holy Spirit move. Amen. And, and it's not that we don't do anything. We can pray. Amen. We can encourage them when they do the right things and when we see the Holy Spirit moving. But we don't need to do the job of the Holy Spirit. We need to get out of the way and let Him move. Even the most unchurched, scripturally illiterate, clueless new convert to Jesus Christ can be totally transformed by yielding to the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen? He's a good uh, regenerator. Amen? Regeneration. He comes in, though our sins were as scarlet, they can be white as snow. That's regeneration. Amen? He takes all our sin stains and he washes them clean. He throws them into his sea of forgetfulness. That's a work of the Holy Spirit. We don't need to do that for them. The Holy Spirit is free to operate in His fullness and most effectively when that convert's faith is properly placed in Jesus and the cross, not religion. Religion tries to fix them from the outside in. God, by His Holy Spirit, works on them from the inside out. And so let's let God do His work. It's not religious rituals. It's not religious ceremonies. It's not religious traditions or religious programs that sets anyone free. It's the message of the cross. Amen. The preaching of the cross is still the power of God unto salvation, which includes our sanctification and our future glorification. That's the whole picture of salvation. We're just in the beginning process when we say yes to Jesus. Amen. Then he shapes us, helps us be in his image and his likeness during this lifetime while he tarries. But one day we're going to stand before him and we're going to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. And that work of salvation will be complete. And it's when we just put our faith in that process that God can shape us, He can mold us, He can shape that unsaved person, and He can uh, work in their lives and do a work. Listen to this quote. Those presently who attempt to ta attach water baptism with salvation or the Lord's Supper or tongues or joining particular churches for that matter are doing the same identical thing as the Judaizers of old that Paul was talking to in Galatia. Jesus plus. You get saved by Jesus and the cross, yes, and your faith in that, but then you need to be baptized in water. That's unscriptural. You can be saved. The thief on the cross was never baptized in water. But what did Jesus say to him? This day you will be with me in paradise. He was saved. He went to heaven. We know that. And so but water baptism is a, a step of obedience we ought to take. But it's not what saves us. It's just an outward sign of the change Jesus already made on the inside. The Lord's Supper, it's an ordinance that we should do. But you can be saved without ever having received the Lord's Supper. And we can go on to each one of those. And we know it's not Jesus plus. They're attempting to add works to grace, which God can never accept. Any professing Christian who thinks that his salvation consists of works or ordinances of any nature is fallen from grace. Meaning the Holy Spirit cannot work the goodness of God into your life because you've fallen from the position at the foot of the cross where grace can be poured out. Does that make sense? That's fallen from grace. That is if they were ever in grace. Salvation is in Christ alone and faith in Him and faith alone secures that salvation. We've got to understand uh, we can't add works 
to God's grace. Amen. It's all about Jesus. When we submit ourselves to error, whether and where we go to church or what we listen to on Christian radio or what we watch on Christian television, practicing the popular philosophy of, oh, I'll just eat the meat and I'll spit out the bones, Pastor Eric. Well, you better be careful, as we said, about those bones. We've just put the integrity of the gospel at stake when we begin to operate with that philosophy. Paul indicated that he would not yield submission even for an hour to any doctrine that came against the gospel of grace, of by grace through faith, that God had revealed to him. We ought to know what God has shown us, amen, about ourselves when he saved us. And if somebody tries to change that, we ought to say, no, red flag, that's not right. That's not right. I'm not even going to consider it for a minute. Because I know, I know that I know that I know that I'm saved. And I know it was through God's redemption plan. Through Jesus' blood. Through no effort or merit of my own. It was all His finished work. We would be wise to follow Paul's example in this in 2016. Not consider. When it says, look at me, look at me, look at me. We ought to say, no, no, no. I'm going to look at Jesus. I'm going to look to Him. Number four. The Jerusalem church and the twelve gave Paul, Barnabas, and Titus the right hands of fellowship. Look at verses 6 through 10. This is the last point, uh, these last uh, few verses. But from those who seem to be something, whatever they were, it makes no difference to me. God shows personal favoritism to no man. For those who seem to be something added nothing to me. But on the contrary, when they saw that the gospel for the uncircumcised had been committed to me as the gospel for the circumcised was to Peter... For he who worked effectively in Peter for the apostleship to the circumcised also worked effectively in me toward the Gentiles. And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that had been given to me, they gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship, that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. They desired only that we should remember the poor, the very thing which I also was eager to do. So we can see uh, these verses that talks about the right hands of fellowship. There was an agreement that what Paul had received was from the Lord. And, uh, and, and good things could result from that. Rather than fighting in strife or feeling threatened, the New Testament church, the church in Jerusalem, could see Paul wasn't working against them. He was working with them on the same mission. This meant that Paul's preaching of the gospel of grace to even the Gentiles was confirmed, not contradicted by the Jerusalem church and the twelve. And remember, he's building a case against the Judaizers that the Galatians are listening to. And they're telling him that because Paul did not, uh, it was not a direct descendant of the twelve, or he didn't have authority from the twelve, he's not really an apostle. So they shouldn't listen to the gospel he preached to them at first. And Paul's telling them they're liars because the twelve have talked to me. And have confirmed that the Lord, what the Lord showed me is the true gospel. And they're in agreement. Not that they called Paul or, or gave him uh, letters of credentials, but they had witnessed Paul. So Paul's telling these Galatians, these uh, Judaizers are liars. And there's a lot of people in the church. They're lying. They're prophylying. <laughs> the Lord told me this, or they think they have authority that God never gave them. This meant that Paul's preaching uh, was confirmed uh, to, even to the Gentiles was confirmed, not contradicted by the Jerusalem Council of the Twelve. The Judaizers were lying to the Galatians, just like many in the modern church are lying to those under their so-called ministry, saying that God said when God never said. Why would they do that, Pastor Eric? Why would somebody who is a minister, why, why would they do that? That's just mean. That's just cruel. That's religion. Remember, religion crucified Jesus Christ. You don't think that was mean? The things they did to Jesus, that was religion. And people who are in position of uh, religious leadership, even in this country, they want control. We've experienced that, haven't we? They want control. And when you mess with their control, when you leave a denomination, I know, <laughs> when you leave a denomination and they lose your pastoral ties, they don't have control over you anymore and you're just doing what God wants you to do. They don't like that. They get mad. They call you on the phone and yell at you. And sometimes worse than that. But if God's called you and He's your source, you don't worry about it. Amen? You just give it to Him. And we need to understand we don't have to be under someone's thumb. God never said half the time the things that some of those people are saying. 
And we ought to be afraid of that. Judgment of God is going to come for some of those people who are prophesying things that God never said. If God said or someone claims to have a word from the Lord for you, it will be confirmed by the written word of God. Amen? If it's not, dismiss it, like we said. Dismiss it. Move on. The Bible, it won't be something extra biblical. There's a lot of extra biblical junk. A lot of what's in the modern church is psychology. It's not even in the Bible. They may attach a couple of scriptures to it, but most of the time they're out of context. And so better you better stick with the Bible. I got some, I actually got a letter this morning here at the Y from somebody in New York. They wouldn't even put their return name or address, but they sent me this packet of stuff and it's all extra biblical stuff. You know, stuff that's not in the Bible, talking about angels. I just read a couple pages and I'm like, if these people, I told Tanya as we're driving home, I said, if these people would spend as much time discovering, investigating, researching, digging into the Word of God as they're doing this extra biblical stuff, they'd be dangerous. They'd have faith. They'd have something that God could use in their life. We're so busy looking for extra biblical stuff. Stick to the Word of God. Find out what God's Word is saying. If it's not written in the written Word, you better dismiss it and you better run away from it. Because uh, it's, it's going to be error. It's going to cause you problems. What does the right hands of fellowship indicate or mean? This was a symbol of alliance, of, of concord, of participation, but certainly not a granting of approval. They mutually agreed that they would go mainly to the Jews while Paul would go principally to the Gentiles. Although this agreement didn't prevent uh, Paul from preaching to his own nationality, he had people that he knew as a Jew that he went to as well. Um, so this wasn't credentials like we know today from denominations, but it was just uh, God's way of bringing the church together and letting them be in unity, true unity that's unity of the faith. Amen. Faith in Jesus and the cross. Not unity for the sake of unity. Not singing kumbaya. You don't agree doctrinally at all with the person you're singing kumbaya with. But uh, unity on the gospel and with the Holy Spirit. Whether you grew up in church or not, you need the gospel of grace. The message of the cross. God's redemption plan. The only remedy for sinners, for, for sinners who have a sin-stained heart is the gospel of grace. That's the remedy. That's what's going to solve this. Water baptism cannot wash away that sin or bring maturity in your Christian walk after you're saved. The Lord's Supper cannot wash away your sin or bring spiritual growth after you're saved. It's not Jesus plus. Amen? That's what Paul is trying to tell the Galatians. Church membership cannot wash away that sin. It can't help you to grow and go deeper in the things of God. Only being a part of a, a fellowship or a Christian organization, affiliation isn't what saves us. It's not what helps us mature and grow either. Our affiliation, just because we're even a, because we're affiliated with SBN or WEF or Jimmy Swaggart Ministries, that doesn't impress God. God doesn't go, oh, wow, yeah. No, what impresses Him is His Son. His Son. And if the organization that we are affiliated with is lifting up His Son, then He's all for that. But we, we get so caught up in titles and organizations and things, and those things don't impress God. Only Jesus' blood can, uh, that was spilled out over 2,000 years ago can wash away our sin stains. Amen? That's what we need to preach. That's what we need to tell the unconverted, the scripturally illiterate, the unchurched. We need to tell them about the blood of Jesus and what it, what it accomplishes in a life when we have faith in Christ. It will also not only wipe away the sin stains, but it will break the grip. It will break the dominion, the power of sin over your life. And it will cause you to grow, to mature, and to become a little bit more like Jesus every day. Jesus, I wake up this morning. I've been saved for 30 some years, but Lord, I want you to wash me again in the blood of Christ. I want to have pure motives, pure thoughts, pure intentions today. Help me to mature in you. It's the blood of Jesus. By faith in Jesus and the cross, you can go from being a slave to sin and be changed into a slave of righteousness. Amen? Romans 6, 7, and 8 tells us that Jesus can be your master over everything by an act of your will. God, I choose to believe that what you did is for me, not to only wipe away the sin state and clean me up, which I needed, 
but to break that control that sin had over my life. And because of that, Jesus, you're my master. You're my savior. You're the one that's going to call the shots in my life. That's what Paul is trying to tell the Galatians. It's not what these Judaizers are preaching. They just want control over you. Most of the times, so they can get money out of you. That's what religious people want. Or power. They want the power they can get out of you. But when we're free in Jesus, we know He's our source. Amen? And we don't have to have approval or accolades from men. We can just trust Him and walk in His path, and He's going to help us. Would you stand with me tonight? I want us to close in prayer. Praise the Lord. Isn't God's Word good? It's a, light into our, a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path. And hopefully there's some things that we've gleaned from this tonight that we can put into practice. If you're not saved and ready for heaven tonight, Jesus is standing at the door and He's knocking. And He's saying, if you'll open the door, I'll come in, I'll eat with you, you can eat with me. He wants to have a close relationship with you. If you're listening to this message and you've gotten away from the Lord, the most crucial decision you can make tonight is to lay your life at the foot of the cross and say, Jesus, I believe what you did was because and it was for my sins. And Lord, I want my sins to be washed away. I want to be ready for heaven should you come back tonight. And I want to encourage you to pray that prayer. Rededicate your heart to the Lord. Don't play games. This is not a time or an hour to be playing games with God. You better have your faith in Jesus and what he did at the cross because he's about to wrap this up. He's about to come for his church. And so if you've not done that, I want to encourage you to do that. Let somebody know that you've given your heart to the Lord. Call us, email us. Let us pray with you and help you in your walk with the Lord. But I believe most of us here tonight are believers. And I want us to sing this song uh, to the ends of the earth. And as we sing this song, I want our hearts cry, our prayer tonight to be, uh, Lord, help me to mature in my faith. I think every one of us can pray that prayer, including myself. Lord, help me to mature in my faith. And Lord, use us to bring this gospel of grace, the same gospel that Paul preached, the message of the cross, both to the churched and the unchurched. There's a lot of dissatisfied church people in this community. Amen. Some of you used to be them. <laughs> and there's some more. There's some more. And they're sitting at home, not going to church because they're frustrated just like you were, looking for a place that preaches the truth. God, use us to reach the churched and the unchurched and bring, us, bring those people across our paths. Give us boldness to sow a seed of the gospel into their life. So as we sing this song, make that your heart's cry tonight, and then we'll uh, close together in prayer.
may not be able to go to the ends of the earth physically, but we can support ministries that are, amen, by our active prayer, giving, and uh, participation in that. And uh, let's let the Lord use us. Would you grab a hold of someone's hand? Let's pray for each other tonight before we dismiss. And then let's just thank the Lord for what He's done both this morning and this evening. Uh, what a great time to be in God's presence and uh, to have Him touch us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank You for tonight. Lord, we thank You for Your Word, what You're teaching us in the book of Galatians. Help us to remember what we're studying, God, as we go throughout the week. Help us to meditate on your word, uh, to think it through, and to see how we can put it into practice in greater ways in our own life. Lord, I pray also, Lord, that as you bring the lost, the unchurched, the scripturally illiterate, God, those who are in the process of dying without Jesus in their life, as they come across our path, God, I pray that you'll move us with compassion for their uh, spiritual condition. Lord, they're spiritually bankrupt. They need you in their life. And I pray that we'll not just pass them by, but God, that we'll look for opportunities to sow a seed of the gospel into their lives. Give us boldness. Give us a sensitivity to the leading of your Holy Spirit and how we can most effectively witness to them. And uh, Lord, I just pray that we'll see a harvest of souls uh, in this community. Lord, I just pray that you'll see the needs of each person, each family that's represented here tonight. Bring answers, bring breakthroughs. Lord, let signs and wonders and miracles and mighty deeds confirm your word that we've studied tonight. And we'll be quick to give you the praise and the glory for all that's accomplished in Jesus' name. Hallelujah.